I would like to say hi to the community and everyone. We have Michelle, Michelle and Alan from Mon the Monkey House. And the Monkey House is an amazing organization that we've been contributing through our giving program. And uh, we are so thrilled. Alicia and I have been so thrilled uh, to connect with you and being able to hopefully make a little bit of a difference and uh, also learn about your mission and about your book that you've written. And today we are here to have a conversation um, as part of the People in My Life program. You know, I, I like to connect our community with the people that have had a big influence on me. And um, it has been a really interesting ride because I realized that I am becoming a better person just by being around people like you and other of my friends and the people who have influenced me. So um, that's why I'm so happy that you're here today. And uh, I have obviously tons of questions and Alicia does have two. And for those of you who don't know Alicia, she's the uh, partner in my Facebook lives. She always answers and helps to answer questions um, and helps to um, make sure that the broadcasts are organized. So I thought it would be nice to have Alicia here because she's also in charge of our giving program. Um, so welcome. Thank you. I'm super excited. This is um, the first time I've said it in one of these interviews and I couldn't think of a better way to start than connecting with um, Jeff and Michelle Allen of Monkey's House. Um, I'm completely excited about spending the next hour together and learning more about their mission and sharing the information with the community so we can enjoy our dogs in their senior years and learn a little bit more about how we can take care of them naturally. You know, every time I meet interesting people, people who have done something really amazing and good, I like to learn about what happened. How did you get to that point of actually starting an organization like the Monkey House, a hospice for uh, senior dogs that would otherwise be either left alone, abandoned, or in really difficult situations and conditions. Um, I, I, I really believe that, that usually it starts somewhere very early when we are formed in our childhood. There may be some crucial points. Uh, what was yours? And I know that he kind of started a different, uh, different, <laughs> different departure areas and then converged in your marriage and also in this mission. So tell me more. Well, yeah, I can start. So thank you for having us first. We're so grateful to be here uh, and talking with you guys. But we both, you know, our early childhood, we kind of grew up sort of the same. We both had a lot of animals, right, in our families. Always, of course, always dogs. We've had cats, um, both of us. I can speak for both of us. And we actually grew up, Michelle was a big equestrian, and my sisters were equestrian, so I actually got into it as well. So we We've had horses. Um, we, I, I know my family we had some cattle. We had all kinds of different animals, and the same thing with Michelle. And then I think when we finally got married, that kind of melted together. And at first, we didn't have a horse at first. And actually, the first dog we got to, the first animal we got together was a dog, and then a couple of cats. And then the next thing you know, Michelle, we got a horse. So why don't you take it from there? So well, I'm a retired registered nurse. Um, who in the in the 80s, you, you know, things are always changing, the latest thinking, the late, latest terms. And they were saying that death was not an acceptable outcome. And I never wanted my patients to die. I cared very much for the people that were that I, that I took care of. And to be told that death isn't an acceptable outcome made me feel like I failed. And I wrestled with that. I wrestled with those words. What does it mean? And honestly, Sometimes you can stop death for a while. Most times you can't. And so to help people live their best life in the hospital very often, um, I, we would give them a tiny bit of control over a situation where they had no control. So bring in pictures from home or get a, back in those days, it was the boom boxes and you would play their favorite music, um, blankets, just things, things that would make it a little easier for them. Then I went really rogue and started getting pet visits. Yeah, you started sneaking in. She started sneaking the dogs <laughs> up the back, the back aisle way, the back stairway to get in there. I learned that when you're dying, 
it's not, it's not like you get a special outfit and you have to be at the bus at a certain time. You're still you. You still have things you want to do. You still need to do things that make you feel normal and that you're still living, actually. Um, and so that impacted on me pretty hard. Um, and then we continued to adopt dogs and then we started fostering dogs. And one of the dogs we fostered in 2010, I think, was a really old golden retriever named Goldie who had a mass on her side that the vet was going to remove and then they were going to make her adoptable. And But at the shelter, she wasn't eating and she wouldn't relax. So Jeff and I fostered her and I could get her to relax. That was no problem, but I could not get her to eat. And I called the shelter and I said, she's not eating. Um, and I, I tried, I, I tried quite hard. Um, so they said, you know, just do what you can, you know, have her, have her back on Wednesday for surgery. So I took her to my vet, which you're not supposed to do. She's not my dog. Um, but I took her to my vet, paid for an exam, um, and got my vet's insight, which was very valuable to me. And that was, she really thought this dog had a brain tumor. Um, she helped me with some anti-nausea meds. You know, she said to give her some sub-Q fluids. You know, she helped me along the way to try and figure things out didn't help and I would look at this dog laying in this bed <clears throat> and I just had this feeling in my stomach this was the wrong move if this was my dog she would not be having the surgery so I called the shelter again and found out who was going to do the surgery and I made an appointment at their office um, and I just made it like I was bringing my dog in for an exam and um, we got checked in and as soon as the tech left us in the room and the veterinarian came in I kind of burst into tears. And I said, this isn't my dog. I, I am responsible for the charges I incur here today, but she needs to have this mask removed and you're gonna do this on Wednesday and it feels like the wrong move. And I told her what I had been doing and um, that I'd seen, seen my other vet and that we were doing, you know, what we were doing. And this vet was really incredible because again, it was the end of her long day and she she very gently told me that this dog Goldie most likely had a brain tumor and was truly entering the the dying phase of, of uh, end of life dying phase, um, and she kind of crushed my heart but made me feel empowered at the same time because I'd worked so hard to advocate for her, and it was it was quite a wake up call. I um, the frustration the the two weeks that I spent trying to get her to eat trying you know, trying so hard to get her to eat anything, taking her to vets, asking for help, not really, they, it's not that they wouldn't listen, they, they weren't set up to, to listen to what I had to say. Mm -hmm. um, but it was a game changer about, there are, there are no resources out there for dogs in this situation, there are none. And her story wouldn't have ended so well. Um, it, well, I mean, we adopted her and she was with us a short time and then, um, you know, we had, we gently assisted her to the Rainbow Bridge. It was just a big wake up call. Um, so then the shelter learned that I was willing to take sicker dogs. <laughs> and, um, we were getting calls day, day and night because Michelle was the one person that could take, you know, most of the sick dogs and, and hopefully help them a little bit or, you know, they'd be with us until yeah. the end. So, so shelter medicine is not set up to to worry about one dog. Shelter medicine is about doing the most they can for as many dogs with the amount of money that they have. And I'm not about that. I'm not going to not give a shelter dog, I'm not going to give them probiotics. I'm not going to not give them vitamins just because they're not my dog. I don't, if they're in my house, they're getting what everyone else gets. Um, and that's whatever they need. Um, so we would adopt them and, you know, see them through the rest of their life with good quality. Um, so it was a gradual kind of transition. Like it was like you just, you know, it seems that your life has been like a river or you've been floating on the river and you just kind of gradually were carried where you were supposed to be. And, you know, you were, you, you were choosing just left, right in the forks, right? But it seems like it just kind of has been a very kind of natural transition. And uh, there was no one to stop you, I can see. Some of my most favorite clients have been actually nurses because you have all the knowledge and the kind of nurturing and caring ability without the ego that's, that, <laughs> that doctors often come with, right? So, so anyway, going back to the monkey house. So was there any start date or point where you just decided, okay, 
this is what we are doing and we have to get the funds and, uh, and, and that's it. Jeff and I struggled. We, we, were, we started to say that there's got to be a way to help more dogs on a grander scheme. Um, but uh, at that point, I should say, I'm, I was a traditionally educated registered nurse. Um, it, it would never occur to me to do all the things with omega-3s that I do now. Um, and it, we, it started us on a journey where most people thought we were nuts. But somewhere on that journey, we met Dr. Morgan. And um, it was great because I had been messing with fresh food, but not having my questions answered well. And she was just do doing a seminar to benefit actually one of the places where I fostered for. And I just hit her with all these questions. What happens if your dog counter serves a whole bunch of food and you've just lost your fresh meal for the night? You know, what do you get? And she named like three things real quick that I could feed that I have in my closet. Um, sh she just really helped put my fears to rest. And I started implementing what I learned in her three hour class on, I think we had nine dogs at that time. Yeah, we had nine dogs. About half of them were ours and we were fostering about the other half. We have a small farm and we were out in our backfield one night. And if you were an observer, you might say that they were all acting really bad, <laughs> like, like little kindergartners running around. But they were all old dogs, really old dogs. And it just made us, it was just like a moment where we realized what we were feeding them was impacting things that I didn't think you could impact. And one of the greatest things that I really want people to understand is if you have a dog from a puppy and, and you're feeding it as well as you can and the more you learn, the more you change, that's great. But if you get your dog at the age of 10 or 15 and they are, have really advanced disease or comorbidities, the same principles apply and you can still change how they feel. You can change how they feel every single day. Um, but that was really a big moment for us where we kind of decided to consider what we fed our dogs, our dog, you know, our dog budget, but also our arts and entertainment budget. <laughs> um, so that, so that, you know, we could give the them cultural, that. the cultural budget for the dogs. I yes. love that. I, you know, it's so important for us as a society to, to acknowledge that, that uh, older age is, is number one, not easy for anyone, right? Like people, some people say, oh, you know, it's, it's, I'll be fine. But, you know, seeing the body and sometimes the mind deteriorate in dogs or people is really hard. But acknowledging that the needs are still there, that the quality of life should be there, that we should not be really writing these animals or these people off just because they got old is actually super important. And I think that you're doing such a great job in that. And, how many dogs have you helped in the course of the existence of the monkey house? We've, we've helped 107 dogs so far. Um, and right now in we five have, years. yeah, in five years. So 2015 is when we, we opened up the, the official nonprofit, right? We were doing a lot of things before that. Um, so 107 dogs. And currently we have 21 dogs here at our home. We also have a forever foster program, which we have another eight dogs in a forever foster home, I think it is right now. Mm -hmm. Sometimes our, our average number is about 25 dogs, but we at one time we were up to 31 dogs. Wow. In the house. <laughs> it's, all, it's a home environment, so there's no kennels. We do have like a converted garage and also a, uh, what we call the cottage on the other side of the garage. So if a dog needs a little bit more private area, instead of 20 dogs in the house, then there's like a few dogs out in, the, in quote the cottage. Because, so you know, dogs can be dog friendly, but they may not like crazy dogs. So the main house is everyone that can tolerate crazy dogs and the crazy dogs. And then the cottage, <laughs> the cottage is more just for those that, you know, can tolerate other dogs. And when it comes to caring for that number of dogs, especially with many of them having special needs and, you know, needing a lot of extra attention, what can you tell us about what we would traditionally call volunteer program? You call them arts and uncles, which I absolutely love. They're part of your family. Um, how does that work into uh, COVID-19 aside, your regular routines for them to come and help out with all of the dogs? Volunteers will get here about 8.30 in the morning. And usually by then the dogs will already be out in the yard. Um, we have a fenced in yard where they'll do their morning business. And the volunteers will help um, clean the floors, figure out what beds need to be washed, kind of get things together. And then we do crate for meals. Um, we have some big dogs that are take a lot of heart pills that we don't want little dogs helping themselves to. And it's also one of the best ways to keep 
piece in a multi-household, multi-dog household scene is to keep them separated at mealtime. So they'll get the dogs in their assigned seats. One dog eats in the bathroom, one dog eats on the front porch, you know, wherever they need to be to, to eat safely. Um, and then um, our food is ready in advance. So the stuff that's lightly cooked is already cooked. The stuff that is thawed is already warmed to room temperature or slightly warmer. And then we sling hash <laughs> individual individual bowls, individual diets, a lot of stuff tweaked, um, a lot of Dr. Tobias's supplements. Then the bowls have, we have a long table and the name is not on the spot on the table and then it's also on the bowl. Um, so when you take the bowl, it's a double check system to make sure you're giving it to the dog because their name is also on the crate. So then everybody eats, then they go for walks, walks that have intent and purpose. Then there's eardrops, eye drops, sub -Q fluids, Bads. Wow. The wow. nice thing about the, the aunts and uncles, so even with today, like we said, they're not coming over so much, um, but they are helping cook food. They're helping do some things that they're not actually coming into the house. We've had a couple of them come over and we'd, we'd bring a couple dogs out on a very nice, recently the weather's been getting very nice here in, on the East Coast, and they take them to the state park. We're like 10 minutes from this beautiful Pine Barrens, right? This huge park. And there's lakes and there's, there's like little rivers. Cranberry bogs. Yeah, cranberry bogs. So they have a great time. And that's the thing. It, it's, and that's the name of the book, right? Where dogs go to live. Even though they're hospice dogs, we want them to live the remaining time they have the best they can. I'm curious, how do you find any time for yourself and to restore, right? Like we know that it has to be about, it's, it's about giving in your case, but is there in your receiving? How do, you, how do you function to not to get depleted and not to get exhausted and burned out in the whole process? So number one, uh, how do you prevent burnout? Number two, do you have any plans on how to kind of expand the mission? So I, I guess I can, I can jump on the first question. Um, I love taking walks, right? And if the weather's nice, I'll go to the state parks myself and I'll take a few of the dogs. And, and I always try to change it up to try to take different dogs as long as they're healthy enough to go with me. And if they, sometimes if they can't walk that well, then they go in wagons. So I'll pull the wagon down the road a half a mile and turn around and come back. And sometimes I'll have pulling a wagon with two other dogs. At least twice a day, I'm out walking with some of the bigger dogs and the dogs that go that I can take a mile, mile plus walk. It's just very relaxing for me. It lets me look back and see that we are doing good. I would say that refreshes me more than anything right now, especially because I don't, you know, I used to go to the gym. I'm not going to the gym. I'm not doing these different things, but that's my relaxation. I know that each have also have uh, been practicing yoga, but you do it in your own own way because in your book, uh, and I want to get to that book too. In your book, uh, you're saying that you're practicing yoga your own way. Uh, uh, what is the what is that way? Tell me, because I, most people think that yoga is just kind of set of poses. Yeah, that you do so, and so, on so yoga. Food. Yeah, most people think it's the postures, right? It's the asana. If you if you're a yogi, yeah. um, and and I did too in a sense. Even being a yoga instructor, right? So I I still see all the my my teachers that taught me, my, and I, I used to say to her, I, you know, I, I just don't have time to do the physical practice, and she would say to me you're doing yoga every day with monkey's house. It's not, it's not necessarily what you do on the mat, but it's, it's how you live your life off the mat. Um, and that's what yoga is about, right? It's, it's how about you center, live your life. Right? About focus, about, yes. about routine, about persistence and consistency and, and discipline. That's so the funny thing is it's very difficult to do yoga here at monkey's house. I've, Michelle has laughed a million times. I started getting to a headstand or doing something and all the dogs instantly, I'm like a magnet. They all come running over. He's like licking me in the face. I'm like, come on guys. I love that. You know, Pax, my dog, he, whenever I start practicing, uh, he comes and he lies down and he's just super quiet. And I, I, I go, okay, this is a good sign. I think I'm on the right track when, when I'm approved by a dog. <laughs> See, it's interesting you say that because Diesel is the opposite. And if I roll out my yoga mat, he's fine and he'll mind his business when I'm doing standing poses. But as soon as I get down to do ab work on the floor, it's playtime. And I have to use my core just to make sure he doesn't knock me over during a pose. That's called doggy but yoga. He likes to get involved. Exactly. I hear you, Jeff. I really feel for you with your headstands. <laughs> we do try to take vacations. We do try to take breaks here and there. It's, it's tough. It's, it's almost exhausting to escape. The other thing is, is 
these dogs give an awful lot of love. You know, I would say 10 hours a day is fun and doesn't feel like service and 10 hours a day does feel like service. <laughs> so you have only four oh, hours to well. sleep? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> depending on who we're sleeping with, we don't always sleep. But, you know, there's, they, they give back more than, they give more than we give, I have to say. As far as our plans for expansion, you know, we work out of our house to keep expenses down, you know, there's there's no overhead. The dogs don't pay rent. We we aren't paid. I don't know how we could function at this level if we needed to rent a facility. Um, you know, people say, could you open a monkey's house in another place? I don't know that we could ever afford to pay someone or to pay like three people that are medical to be, you know, observant, you know, around around the clock. So I think what we need to do is reach individuals. We we work with other rescues, mostly local rescues, um, where we're all friends, we're on call for each other, and you know they'll, they'll call me at one o'clock in the morning and say, so-and-so is having a seizure that's not stopping. We'll talk about you know what tests are really necessary before an old dog goes through a dental. So I offer support like that for local rescues, and then people will write to me, people that are willing to keep their dogs and wanna know the best way to help their dogs, um, I'm 100% willing to help in, in ways that I can. Sometimes people just want to ask, you know, that if, if the dog needs a dental and the, and the veterinarian wants to do blood work and the people aren't sure if they should do that. They want to say, like, the dog is old. And I, I think hearing that the blood work reflects how the kidneys are doing and how the liver is doing and that you can impact that. I, you know, you can, you can, if their kidneys aren't so great, there's things you can do to get them ready for the dental to make it successful. And I think people don't realize how painful bad teeth are for old dogs. So I, I try to be a resource that encourages people to work with their vet and to keep asking questions, you know, keep asking questions. I kind of say that if you don't want to hug your vet, find another vet because some people just don't resonate. There's not that chemistry and it makes, it makes all the difference in the world. We, we can't, we can't help all the dogs, but we need no. everyone else to try. And that's the thing. When we, when we first started, and it still is, it's all about the dogs. And, and, and Dr. Tobias, I think you might have said it. I think the nurse and Michelle, right? And your other, your other nurse friends that you know, um, it was all about the patient for them. Now, it doesn't matter if it's a human patient or a dog patient. Michelle, it's like, it's all about the patient. And now it's the dog, obviously. And when we started, she started this Facebook page for us, and it has grown quite a bit, right? We have, we have quite a few followers. But we didn't expect it. We weren't looking for that, right? We weren't looking for this big community. We love the community that we have. And that's one way that we can expand. Not physically, not really monkey's house, but Michelle getting that knowledge out, us getting that knowledge out. What we really love is seeing someone says, you know what? I took a chance by following you. I went out and adopted a senior dog with medical issues. I mean, that's what we want to hear. I love the idea of... Um you talking, talking about how to make the decisions. And I've often seen in veterinary medicine and especially in the, in the kind of more scientific and, and conventional circles that in humans or dogs that as soon as condition comes, we become into, we kind of go into this kind of almost robotic mode and follow the protocols and treatment protocols. And sometimes it seems that the patient is forgotten in that. And that sometimes maybe doing nothing is actually much better than doing all these procedures and surgeries. And I see people often confused and almost feeling guilty that they feel like, well, maybe I shouldn't be doing all this. Maybe if my dog could decide, maybe he would just want to be and, and, and you know, just live the life that, that is ending, but be in peace and comfort and, and having that love and care. That's the most important part. How do you deal with some of these decisions? Uh, you know, how, what would you tell dog lovers who are, who are seeing that their dogs are nearing the end of their life and they're sometimes talked into decisions or into procedures and, and tests and, and, and treatments that are not maybe necessary or they seem to be futile or excessive or almost the other side of the spectrum of neglect, right? Like, how do you deal with that? What would you advice to dog lovers that have seen your dogs? So my advice is to look at your dog. Um, so we, we had a 
Spiegel that we had loved fiercely. Um, he was adopted later in life. He adored us and had a great life with us, terrified of everything else, just terrified of any noise, afraid of the car, afraid of strangers. Um, and on a routine physical, um, one thing led to another and we found he had an enlarged spleen and hemangiosarcoma. And we got the spleen out because I didn't want him to die of a ruptured, of a ruptured spleen, but we didn't seek other treatment. I would have liked to have gone further, but um, it wasn't the right move for Harvey. And for over nine months, he led a tremendous, you didn't know he was sick. I almost, I almost allowed myself to forget that he was sick. Um, and then all of a sudden one weekend, he didn't want to eat. And you know when beagles don't eat? Well, that's not good. Um, so we made a quick trip into Dr. Morgan and, um, you know, she always says nothing, nothing dies without the benefit of steroids. Um, but even, even that did not give him the quality that he needed. Um, so we didn't take it any further. Um, there wasn't any point because he was afraid. He was, he was afraid even to go into the other room to have blood taken. He was afraid. So, um, that was his story, but for the most part, um, we take our dogs every week um, somewhere. A lot of them go to, to a rehab. Um, and so getting used to riding in vehicles. For drinking um, or some sort of stuff? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that, that might be where the self-care re- for the self-care for the <laughs> Sorry, um, I thought I would, is, I would crack the joke. <laughs> it's actually a magical place with magical people. They have cold laser or acupuncture, underwater treadmill. You know, the gift of mobility and independence is mm-hmm. something incredible. And I think the difference between our dogs and dogs that people have had the entire length of time that the dog has had is that our dogs have been let down by their family. People can't help dying. Um, sometimes people die and they leave pets behind. But when the families choose to put the dog in the shelter, that's really sad. And generally, if people have been through a long illness, the dog gets neglected, not intentionally, but, you know, they get matted. Um, the matting causes them to lose an eye or something else worse. Um, so these dogs are dumped in the shelter under in grieving and in bad condition. And I feel like we need to make it up to them. So if they're up to it, they go to the vet. You know, if the techs give them more cookies in exchange for, you know, a blood draw than what they'll get here, they'll gladly take the moment of blood draw for the carbs that they're deprived of here. We'll do an x-ray to look to see if the shortness of breath is something that might make us need to make a decision sooner rather than later about letting them go. Um, One of the things I've learned is that kidney failure is just a very bad name for, for kidneys wearing out. They, they still can go for a very long time mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. with kidney disease. And it's just, it, the thing is, you can't take that name kidney failure and put a positive spin on it. And yet I can tell you, if you come up and say your dog is in, you know, stage two kidney failure, I'll say, you got a lot of time. This is what you need to do. You know, don't put a time limit on it, but know that you got years. I love that you're saying that. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I've been, you know, I've been one of those people who actually often say that, that kidney disease is not a death sentence. And when it's maintained properly, that really, as you say, it can go for years without a problem. I would actually, I, you know, I usually use the term kidney insufficiency, which means that it, they're not sufficiently filtering, but they're still functioning as opposed to failure is, you know, we see failure as uh, engine failure. It shuts off, right? And that's not true. And, uh, it's hard for me to understand, and, and I'd like, I'm sure that some of our listeners and viewers would like to know and understand, what are the stories of people, or how can people actually give up their dogs? Like, I can't even imagine, like, dropping my senior dog off in a shelter. It's a dangerous precedent to set, to get, to, to dispose of something you love because they're not convenient, because there are nursing homes for people, and, you know... I think there, I, I think, I, I'm not saying there aren't times when people surrender dogs and they're, they're crying. And it could be that the dog got hit by a car and they know that they don't have the money. Um, someone's dog was shot and they didn't have the money. When rescues hear about this stuff, they'll step up and help them. They'll help, they'll help them do what they need to do 
um, to keep the dog. The one shelter we deal with the most, they have a rescue that if people can't afford euthanasia with the veterinarian, they'll pay for a vet visit if the vet wants to do an x-ray or some blood work just to make sure. Um, but they'll also pay for the, for the euthanasia with the veterinarian and the family there. And people opt not to do that. And that um, sets a level of anger in me that I don't like to tap into. I try not to, I kind of draw a line there because I, I can't imagine that kind of betrayal. And honestly, when people say, you know, why, why do you do this? It's that I hate, I hate that these dogs just disappear in the back of the shelter and, and no one knows their story. And if, if you ask any one of our Facebook family that's from anywhere around the world, if, if you name the name of a dog, if you name Bull, who's a giant coonhound, they would tell you stories about him like they knew him, like they knew that he was special. And my question when the shelter asks if we'll take the dog is not if he's special, it's how sick do you think he is? With kidney issues, as we've talked, that's not a reason that's gonna take them from us anytime soon. They don't actually need skilled care. They, need, they, they don't need medical care. They need food care um, and supplement care. Um, they don't need the medical care that we give. We took a, a German shepherd not that long ago who had GM, doggy ALS, and he was down behind and in front. So he couldn't, he couldn't move. Um, and that's the kind of dog we're taking. We, we, were, we would prefer that they not be down in front. <laughs> no, and 90, and 90 pounds. <laughs> but, but, but so, so we can give a very specific skill, clinical skills to dogs here. Um, we have dogs, you know, you know, people say, oh, my dog is in congestive heart failure and, and they'll freak out. And, you know, I'll say, what did the cardiologist say? Or can I see the report? And they'll say, this dog is 12 or this dog is 14. And I'm like, if you want them to see 15, go get the cardiology report. They can go in and out of active congestive heart failure for years if you mm -hmm. learn to manage it and you learn to catch the signs early and tweak their meds for a little bit with the assistance of a veterinarian. Many of the dogs that come here, our, our focus is on the quality. I think I said that before, the quality for the remaining time that they have. So we're not focused on the quantity of time, right? We're not saying, oh, we want this dog. Okay, you said it's going to be around for three months. We want it here for three years. We don't say that. But what we find with the, the food, the nutrition that we give them, the supplements, um, the great vet care, and I think it's the home environment and love, whatever it is, all this combination, then you get that extension, right? And not just extension, but healthy and, you know, happy living. Again, I bring that word up, living, right? So they're actually living um, quality lives for the time they have remaining, plus they're getting a lot more. Age that's the, that doesn't mean anything. It doesn't mean anything. If a six-year-old dog is full of cancer and in pain that you can't control, the most loving thing you can do is let them go. Mm -hmm. By the same token, if they're 20 and their kidneys look a little eh, change their diet. Take them for a walk. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. that's all. That's all you need to do. Just keep going. I really hear the passion in the education and the message that you're trying to, you know, promote and, and give out to the world so that more people can understand that, some of these things are not a death sentence and that they can manage and enjoy their, their dog's final years. But I did want to touch on one thing if we can, which is mentioned in your book, which I'm sure we're going to jump right into. But when it comes to some of these dogs that are given up to shelters through various circumstances, sometimes it's because the, uh, the human has either passed or maybe is no longer able to care for them due to illness or injury. Um, can you touch on, you know, in an ideal situation, what humans can do to make plans for their own passing, whether it's um, something sudden or something that's anticipated to make sure that their dogs are actually cared for um, after something, you know, unexpected perhaps has happened to them. It's something that I wish everyone would do um, is to plan if, if their dogs outlive them. Um, we adopted a puppy last year and on the adoption contract, we're supposed to return him to them. They're, he's microchipped to them and us. But I wrote my executor's phone number and I said, you know, they'll, they'll contact them. You, you know, I want everyone to be in contact so that there's money for if the dog needs anything, any, anything we need to do to get them to the best home. Um, but if, if people, even if they don't have anyone in mind to, to take their pets, 
contact your vet and ask them what rescues they work with. Because vets will tell you, like, there's some that are great with little dogs, some that are great with big dogs, some that are fine with aggressive dogs. They'll say, this rescue will best meet your needs. Then you contact those rescues and you say, hey, I've got issues and I have three dogs. Um, they may ask for a donation in advance or they may say, listen, um, please have your executor, please leave your executor some money so that they can have a dog walker and, and board the dogs while they find a play appropriate placement. Um, sometimes reaching out to a vet tech, there's, there's people that will help in a pinch. Um, but those people that are helping in a pinch are usually the same people that help all the time. So the more people that can plan, the better the transition yeah. is for the dogs. Yeah, we've many years ago, when we had, when we had the horses and everything, we, we actually said, okay, X amount of money in our will was for the care of these animals until their death. And it, was, it wasn't a small, you know, we had a lot of animals. So it was, we gave, okay, this is going to go to the, to the pets because, you know, it's our responsibility. We want them to not end up like dogs that we get. You know, somebody just, you know, takes them to the shelter and they're in bad health because they weren't taken care of. And that, in the U.S., that's called a simple trust. So anyone that is working on their will, um, the, the, the people caring for your pets get money for a certain amount of time. And then when that pet dies, um, your beneficiaries get any money if there's any money left. Um, you know, but planning ahead, um, again, leaving even just a little bit of cash for, for dog walkers, for groomers, to get the dog professionally groomed, to get it to the vet, to get it, you know, any care that it needs. Just there's a lot of stuff we can do to plan ahead. And also making sure that the money is actually used for that purpose, right? Note that I think most people would uh, would definitely do that, but there may be some people who will try to cheap out on the dog care and uh, go for the holidays. So it's super important to actually put, put uh, measures in place that will actually protect uh, the pet. And, and I, you know, every, every time I change my will, which doesn't happen very often, I make sure that, that everything is outlined there. And, and it's super important. And I, I, I would recommend that. And I, I, I definitely agree with you hundred percent. So many people are afraid of seeing their dogs age and, and, I must confess that I am too. Like, you know, when my dog Sky started to kind of deteriorate, you know, and he was 14, 15, 16, and I could see his mobility decreasing, and I could just kind of, you know, I could see myself bracing for, for the inevitable. Um, I did my best. I did, you know, I, 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 I did rehab and I did underwater treadmill and massage and chiropractics and, and, and good nutrition and everything that you're suggesting here. But still, there is the inevitable. And I have learned to understand that our dogs tell us about when the time came. And sometimes people ask, so how long will my dog live? What do, you, what do you tell them? I, I know what I tell them, but I'm curious what you tell them uh, when, when they ask this question. So I tell them to let their dog answer that question. I think the most important thing, Dr. Tobias, is people don't ever talk about their dog dying. No one wants to talk about that day. There is no amount of preparation. How do you talk about having, being hit in the face as hard as you possibly can? Like, like how, do you, how do you discuss that kind of, it, it's, it's, terrible pain. There's not really a way to prepare for it. There's really not a way to see it coming that makes it easy. There, there really isn't. Um, and so I always say, don't have any regrets. If you really want to take the dog to the beach, go today. If you really want to try a, a, a different kind of diet, do it now. If you really want a different, a second opinion, call now. Like don't, don't wait because things creep up and time gets away and having regrets is tough. You're going to have grief mm -hmm. and loss, mm -hmm. but we need people to recover and, a, and get another dog. <laughs> we need these, we, we need, we need good homes for our pets. So we need people to recover fast enough. And I know that they love us in a way that's so unconditional. They would not want us to be sad for the rest of our life. I'm not saying I don't cry in my car. I don't get, I have my crazy moments. Um, I have some really crazy moments, but they don't want us to, to carry a burden from having loved them and lost them. They want us to grow and be better and take better care of our next dog. So it's, it's all lessons that they teach us. And 
you know, for us here, we have a criteria of um, uh, if, if they're having trouble with breathing and it looks like it's going to get worse, then we ask the vet to come out and help them cross gently. If um, they have seizures that we can't break, then we'll euthanize them. And if they have pain that they can't control, then mm -hmm. we'll euthanize them. One of my greatest teachers was a 17 pound dog named Buck who came to us with every diagnosis, you name it, yes, he had it, including deaf and blind, congestive heart failure, pulmonary hypertension, pulmonary fibrosis, cancer. He had it all and he had an incredible quality of life here. But he was with us for four years and two months. And one of the things I can say about him was he was 17 pounds. It was easy for me to carry him in his bed from room to room, or if I had to take other dogs to the vet and he wasn't feeling good, I would carry him in his bed and he would just, he would just go with us. So I could tell you exactly how he was. If he needed something every four hours, I could just give it to him. He was cooperative with medications. He was cooperative with eye drops. He was cooperative with shots. Whatever I needed to give, he, he trusted. And I've, I've had dogs who weren't. And you know, there's certain time, if, Sometimes when dogs aren't eating, they just need an appetite stimulant or some fluids to get them over a hump. And sometimes they stop eating because they're getting ready to, to, to pass on their own. Mm. I think if you're not clear on what time that, what that is, then you want to continue with a little bit of meds or some fluids or something. And some dogs are not open to that. You feel like you're crossing the line when you're trying to, to get fluid into mm. them or, you know. Mm -hmm. so, so the fact that Buck was cooperative with this was a I'm going to tell you, I loved him tremendously. So if you said, well, you loved him more, I might, <laughs> I might be lying if I said that's not the reason. <laughs> but we've lost dogs that were less sick than him because they were 80 pounds and I couldn't keep an eye on them all the time. And I were worried that their seizures were getting worse or I couldn't control their pain because they would growl if I came near them with food, with medicine, with injections. You know, if, if you can't keep them comfortable, you're not doing them any favors by keeping them here. You need to let them go. You know, uh, so many people ask me in the course of my work what the life expectancy of their dog is. And I, I usually say, you know, dogs don't have an expiry date. And I'm, I, I, I don't think that I can ever give you a number. I will not give you a number because it's, uh, you know, often when someone gives um, a dog lover number, it's really strange because when someone says your dog is going to live until he's 13 or on there, like by the age of they hit 13 and suddenly they start becoming sick. And I often question whether it's just because these people were told it's 13. Right. And so I, I think that as long as possible and, and, you know, getting the gift of extra time is really important. And I, I love that you're actually also um, giving me the idea that, that you're seeing the same thing that I've seen and many people have seen that the senior dogs, when we give them the fuel and when we nourish them well and when their body is cared for and massaged and exercised, that they actually do better and that applies to animals or people. Now, I'd like to touch the book a little bit. I know that the book is um, available for sale and there are amazing stories in the book. Um, you know, it's a feel-good book. It's a book that everyone should read, especially now in the difficult times of COVID era. Tell me what, why you wrote the book and, uh, and tell me your favorite part of the book that you wrote. I mean, I started this book, I started this book a couple of years ago. As Michelle said, we don't want to see these, you know, these dogs, if we didn't take them, they would have been destroyed, right? In the back of the shelter, no one would have known about them. Their stories need to be told. And, and not just their stories, but the, you know, the transformation they go through. And it's funny, when I say transformation, a lot of people will say, oh, well, this sick dog all of a sudden became healthy and he's fine. That's not what transformation means with, for us. Transformation for us means that yeah, they, they have a lot of medical issues and they're terminal, but that we get them as healthy as possible. Dogs that are supposed to be gone in a month that are still here nine months later. Um, so that's the kind of transformation. And we just wanted to tell the stories of these dogs. These dogs, they deserve to have the stories told, right? So that's kind of why I started writing the, the book. And you know, it's, at first it was, we, Michelle and I, mostly Michelle, but we post on, on our Facebook page every night um, I think Michelle does it more now than I used to do a little bit more, but now with the book, I was so busy. Uh, but she's very educational and she'll help educate. And I'm kind of comes in and I'm, I'm more lighthearted, right? And I try to put a little more humor into it. Hmm. Um, 
and then people kept saying, oh, you have to write a book. You have to write a book, right? And we're like, how do we have time to write a book? Well, then I started writing the book, right? And I would, I would take some notes from, from maybe from the Facebook posts that, that did really well or start combining some things together. And, and it just worked. It, it just, and then I would talk to Michelle and say, hey, Michelle, what, how about this? You know, and we'd, I'd, I'd bounce some things off of her. Mm -hmm. And if you do, you know, hopefully you'll get the book. Um, and reading, reading the stories, you'll see a lot of the things in there are by, you know, a lot of Michelle's stories are in there. But we even have a couple of stories of our aunts that are included in the book as well. Um, but I, I do like, like I, I talked about transformation and one of my favorite stories is Holly, which was a German shepherd. And, uh, she's in a chapter called the journey forward. She came, she was the one that came like the thinnest dog we ever had. I think Michelle, right? The thinnest dog we ever saw that lived. Yeah. She came in at, I think 27 pounds. If I remember a German shepherd now think of 27 pounds. And when she first came first, first she was like very quiet. But then she turned very, well, very somewhat aggressive. I wouldn't say aggressive, but growling at everybody. Michelle was the only one that could go into the suite for six weeks to, to, you know, to help her. Started walking her and see her grow into a dog that then loved people, loved cats, liked other dogs, living with her own little pack out in the cottage. Um, I think, and, and, and the most heartwarming thing for me, it sounds weird, is she... I, I joke that she was a, she used to lick her food. Like you have a dog that's like a liquor. It takes a long time for them to really eat. And she had some stomach problems and, and other health issues. So I would like dip my hand into this raw food and she would then start gulping it out of my hand. So she'd get all the pills in, you know, she would <laughs> gently nibble on my fingers sometime. I'm like, Hey, Hey, that's my hand. Right? Um, but that was like our time together in the evening. I'd sit there and I would do that every night. And it was like our time together. And she, she'd take her tongue and like lick the food between my fingers when she was done, like cleaned it up. And it, it was just, it was amazing time for me to, to spend and help that dog transform. And here's a dog that was growling that's eating out of the palm of my hand. She started having pain that we could see and we couldn't figure out. And she looked like her front legs were too long for her. And she was dragging her back legs. And, you know, the shepherd makes you start to think about DM. And her pain was so bad. I mean, I was going out there every four hours and saying, giving her pain medicines and saying, we're, we're going to lose her. Like, like, why can't I control this pain? Then all of a sudden, one day, the pain went away and she was paralyzed. And it's a matter of just backing up and saying, okay, she's paralyzed, but she's also really zen. Like she, she, she didn't have the pain. Um, so, you know, rehab, a cart, keeping her skin clean and dry, turning her, you know, our responsibilities changed, but it was a health turn for the better for her journey. Um, you know, I'm not saying we had a party when we found out she was paralyzed, um, but it, it made her more comfortable and we didn't have to lose her because we couldn't control her pain. You know, she, she had more time after that. Mm -hmm. And I think also when you have dogs that come from bad circumstances, um, we had one dog that was with us for just a few weeks and then he got vestibular syndrome, the drunk dog syndrome. And that can be kind of debilitating sometimes for dogs. And he was, this dog was permanently a little bit dizzy, I think. And they said, why does this have to happen? He just got here. Life was going to get good. And I said, life is still good. And this is our opportunity to say our love is unconditional. Just like he was willing to come here and trust us and give us the benefit of the doubt. This is our opportunity to step up and say, hey, buddy, so long as you want to be here, so long as you want to go out in the backyard and do the ugliest trot I've ever seen, <laughs> we're going to be here to help you up and help you do it. So it's our chance to step up and say, hey, humans, humans are okay. You, you can trust us. We are going to be here for you. So it stinks that sometimes they come here and they get acutely worse, but it's just our chance to up our game and make sure that they know that we're here for them for as long as they want to be here. And with the mobility, which we touched on earlier, it being such an important part of their quality of life, um, when they do have back-end issues in particular, and I think you mentioned Doza and Ariel specifically in the book, um, as well as Holly, I'd love to learn more about how you fit carts to these dogs and who helps you with that. 
Um, there was a quote in the book that I actually wrote down, which I love. It says, I thought of the cart not as a symbol of disability, but as a chariot of independence. <laughs> yeah, I was looking at that picture. Um, I, well, I don't know if I have the picture in the book, but there's a picture of Holly that's in the, the quad cart that I have, right? And I was looking at it one time and, you know, some people might say, ah, oh, you know, that poor dog is in a cart. And this, and, but as Michelle was saying, here she was, she became paralyzed in the back end and we, we, would, roll, we would move her and, and make sure she was clean and do everything we needed for her. And then we got her into this cart. And to me, it's now she's independent in a sense, right? So now she has her own independence back. And I, so it's not, it's not something negative. It's a, it's a chariot of independence. So I, I did. I was like, I was like wow, I like him over that quote. It's, <laughs> <cool."> <laughs> it's amazing. I love it. I love it. And, and when you take the minibus. Uh, yes. Tell us about an adventure, a day in uh, maybe out to the beach. I know that the dogs, even you mentioned that in the book, even if a dog has lost its sight, that when they go to the beach, you can just see and feel them kind of perk up. Tell us about your beach adventures with the wagon wagon. Yeah, so I have a chapter in the book called No Ordinary Day at the Beach, right? Because it's not ordinary because there's 25, 30 dogs going down to the beach. And we have a, we have a senior citizen bus, which is now a senior dog bus, um, that's called Wagon One. And as you know, probably in the U.S., right, the president has Air Force One. Well, we have Wagon One. <laughs> so we, we get all the dogs on the bus. The volunteers will go down with us. And everybody just goes on the beach. And some of the bigger dogs may have to be in a wagon, <laughs> four-wheel wagons. Some of the smaller dogs are in strollers. It's like there's, there's different types of strollers that you can get for dogs. So they'll be in the strollers. And everybody else is walking dogs. Some walk slow. Some just kind of get down to the water, just a few inches of water, and that's about it. But like you said, there's tequila. And tequila is one of Michelle's favorite dogs, too. She doesn't have favorites, though. Um, but tequila, so it's <laughs> perfect right there. Oh yeah, no, no, no. I, you, you could just keep to these <laughs> oh, oh goodness. Anyway, you have to learn about this doggy bus. <laughs> so, so tequila. Um, so he was rescued from from a shelter, um, and eventually he lost both his eyes. So they were very painful. And you had to. I won't get into the whole story, but so he has no eyes, and. He's got other medical conditions heart as issues. well. Yeah, he's got heart issues. And he's deaf. He's, he's deaf. He's, he's, so he's really got not a whole lot going on for him, but he's got everything going for him, right? Because he's at Monkey's house. And well, I was walking him on the beach, and I'm walking another Cocker Spaniel, which is funny because I always complain in the show about the Cocker Spaniels because they have Cocker tubes, right? These, these dogs have <laughs> attitudes, um, although I love them to death. And Michelle looks over at me, and, she's, and she squeezes my hand, and, and she says, look at... She goes, look at Tequila. He's having such a good time. And you looked at him, he looked like a prize dog, right? He's, he's sitting there and he's just, the wind is blowing through his hair. And so I always say, look, don't let uh, a disability be an inability. Because this dog who has a lot of disabilities has the ability to be on the beach enjoying his life. So we can learn so much from these dogs. We could take that as people, right? If, if we get something that we have something with ourselves, you can still enjoy life. You can still do a lot of things, so. Something that's really incredible is our volunteers. We have a volunteer page and they keep in touch with how all the dogs are doing, but it might be too hot outside for a dog with heart issues to be outside. So I'll say, this one doesn't go outside today. And they'll say, well, can I put him in my car with air conditioning on? Um, or I'll say, this dog is not walking anymore. <laughs> and and they'll just say, they'll say, you know, do we get the wagon? Do we get the carriage? You know, we have all different ways to transport them if they're having troubles with mobility. And honestly, if a dog is, people say, what about their quality of life? Now, a dog that can't move does not have a good quality of life. Mm -hmm. So if your dog can't move, you need to be able to keep them clean, bring them water all the time, keep them dry, move them, turn them, and bring them places that have different smells and give them different adventures. If you're going to just sit in the room and be sad, that's mm -hmm. not quality. So you have to be able to say, hey, you know, we've still got adventures to have, it's just that they're going to be different now. And you have to have that same confidence and plan the same amount of adventures, if not more adventures, um, because things are different, but they can be just as good. They can be just as wonderful. 
I love that because, you know, I, I, I believe that uh, if a dog can move, but he's otherwise happy or she, and, and they seem to enjoy life, just taking them to a park or just hang out at the beach or a coffee shop and uh, make them engage with other dogs that come by or other people, I think that it's super, super important. It's almost like, you know, if someone is bedridden, you just push the bed out on the terrace on the deck or just take people in the wheelchair and that's the same thing. I, I can't even say enough how touched I am by this conversation. Uh, I, I hope that we'll be working together for many more years. And uh, I also hope that uh, the viewers, um, you guys will purchase the book uh, that is available. So yeah, we have a, a monkeyshouse.org website and the book, you can get the book. Um, well, it's not through us, but yeah, there's a link to go buy the book. Uh, you can get it at all, any local bookstores will carry it as well. Uh, if they don't carry it, they can get it. You can get it on Amazon. There's a bunch of places you can, wherever you would normally buy a book, you should be able to get this book. And yeah, it's well, called Where Dogs Go to Live, right? To live, exactly. It, and that's correct. Where Dogs Go to Live. Do you have any advice for people that want to help but aren't really sure how? Um, there are a lot of different volunteer organizations, but if there's something that you could message to the community of dog lovers at large, um, how can they help Monkey's House? How can they help dogs in general or organizations? Um, if they're not sure how they can help, what would your advice be? So if you're not sure of the integrity of the organization, you can find out who their vet is and pay the vet directly. Um, no one is going to complain about having some dollars taken off of their bill. Um, you can donate food to the organization. You can donate your time, towels, detergent, that kind of thing. Um, helping us out specifically, um, monkeyshouse.org. Um, we, we are grateful for financial donations, but you can help us out through Amazon. We have a wish list with our products that we are in need of. Um, there's also Amazon Smile, where um, a very small portion of a person's purchases will be donated to us in a quarterly period. Um, just supporting fundraisers. Yeah, there's, there's different things. On our website, there's a donate page that tells you a bunch of different things. And then uh, one big thing, so a portion, a portion of the proceeds from the book are going back to Monkey's House. So, uh, you know, if you buy this book, uh, there's a few things I do, I do ask. If you, if you really enjoy it, leave a, leave a, a positive review uh, wherever you bought it from. If you bought it from Amazon or bought it from Barnes and wherever, if you bought it online, obviously. Um, and then there's, like, there's some different things. If you could, it, it, it directs you to Monkey's House if you want to come to Monkey's House and volunteer or donate. And then I also have a, a resources page in the back of the book, a few pages on different um, veterinarians, um, organizations, uh, you know, Dr. Tobias is listed on there as well, and different rescues that we work with or that we, we feel, you know, these are, these are organizations that we have a lot of respect for, and there's a lot of information that people can get uh, through these organizations to help their dogs. The other thing is, is if, if you just want to help one time, if you want to do one thing, if you know a neighbor on your street isn't well, but you think that there is help going in, if, if they have a dog, ask if the dog needs a trip to the groomer. Mats, mats are very painful. We all feel better when we're good and squeaky clean. Ask if the dog needs veterinary care or if the dog needs their medications renewed from the veterinarian. See if you can do anything to make it just a little bit easier. If the people work full time and they have a dog that you can see is slowing down, and you're talking with them, if, they, if, if you're home, ask if, you, if they want them to pop in at noontime and, and visit the dog, make sure the dog is okay, give the dog a potty break. Anything you can do to make it easier for people who have dogs in their older years, have the supervision that they need and the love that they need, it helps the dog, it helps the owner, and it helps humanity. It really does. It, it, you'll feel better for having done it. I wish you all the best and all your doggies. And thank you so much for spending the time with us. And, uh, and we'll talk again. Thank okay. you. Thank you, all of you. Yes, hug <laughs> to you guys too. Thank you. Bye-bye.